Helena Bahadze, a cognitive psychologist in Greece, who speaks 19 languages. And this recording is being made for the annual Polyglot Conference that would have been, it would have taken place this year in Solula. And today is October the 10th, 20. Um, it is a presentation for a window into my world about language maintenance, about um, an aging polyglot who also happens to be a memory scientist. And I would like to explain to you some of the things that I have learned over life so that you can also use it. To begin with, I would like to say hello to you. And maybe the fastest way to do so is to say, are you born? Which means basically hello in Sinhala, the uh, official language of Sri Lanka. And it says, may your age be long. You hear the word are you, and you think of the English word age as cognate. And of course, many words from Namaste, Marhaba to Shalom, yes, as is Drastri. I was actually able to get to Singhala because I learned other languages from the same language family of these Indo Aryan languages. Jadme Joanthi, Mene Hindi Sikhi, Badme, Vishwa Bankme, Maile Nepali Sikhi, or Ekaishumoi, Ami Bangla Shikhi Tarikhi. I was able to do that because I could do Hindi and then I went into Bangla and Nepali. But before that, when I was younger, and in between, I learned Hebrew, and I used that to learn a fair amount of Arabic. And, when I evaluated the educational project, I went to Romania. I went to Romania. When there, the Jet and J, the Soviet Navon in Chipri, I did the same thing in Albania. Saya Suda Mengujungi, Banyak Sekola Sekola, the Malaysia than Indonesia. Then I did that in Malaysia and Indonesia. Ari, Nahitan in Pianatra, Namaki Teni, that to Madagascara. I did that also in Madagascar, in Malagasy. Well, how well will you speak languages when you, that you learned when you're 70, 80, 90? That is our question. Most of you probably are young adults and you have grown up with a bunch of languages. You're enthusiastically learning more of what I see in various Facebook posts. So how will your memory functions change with age? Well, here's next. I will tell you a little bit about the personal story of language learning and anecdotes. What happens to memory as we age? What do I do as I'm approaching age 70? Which gives a little bit of advice for your older self. Unlike many of the younger generation, I was born in 1951 in a monolingual family. I knew nothing but Greek. I started English in grades five to six. Then I was able to make it to Anatolia College, which I was in secondary school at that time, I was in college university in Thessaloniki, which was Greek medium with much English training. And I went to go to the Institute for German for grades 8, 12, 10 to 12. I also taught myself Italian and French from a teach yourself method at age of 16 to 18. That's because I wanted to understand what the Italian songs were saying at the time when we were saying, well, I got to learn that. And the last of the languages that I learned, it was from my previous ancestors. Therefore, you all probably have a greater facility for automatizing materials than I do. Interestingly, being born, having been born Greek for this particular skill has been a huge blessing. It stands on a good crossroad of languages, European as well as the, the North Indian languages. But, you know, when I was young, I was an average student. At the same time, I had this sense of etymology that even teachers noticed when I was messing up, but I could see what ancient Greek words were related to what. Um, at the time, 
It was in the old traditional methods that made us conjugate nouns and verbs all over the place. Well, that was extremely useful in subsequent years. The skill and the search for conjugations, those repetitive patterns in the predictive order that are so important um, to memorize what is it some moment in absence material. And that I have discussed a lot and have brought out the research on all of the issues related to standard Arabic. Unlike, therefore, other hyperpolyglots, I'm not a linguist, I'm not a professional translator, I'm not even a language major. I just use languages as a means to get job, the job done better. And I rely a lot on the language families using core vocabulary, etymology, conjugation patterns, to go from one thing to the other. Very interesting, as I found out when I was young, speaking someone language, someone's language creates trust and a sense of kinship, probably for evolutionary reasons. So particularly those lesser known languages to native speakers, you know, it votes positive sentiments, they get me going. I mean, people hear me speak Hindi, Arab, you know, Hindi particularly, or the other languages, they go, oh my God, you can do that. The Pakistani drivers remember me. When I start singing old Hindi songs to them, they go gaga. So these matters, these situations matter very much. You know, when I speak languages like Albanian, people get shocked. I go into it, I went one time, I had to travel from my hometown, Thessaloniki, to Tirana to give a presentation while it was the World Bank, I got on the bus. Um, someone said, you know, we need to give passwords to cross the border. I spoke up in Albanian. Everybody understood that I was a Greek and not an Albanian. They started clapping. They started, they, they treated me with coffee. It was hilarious. And it's been done many times. So it keeps me going. I went to present, gave a presentation partially in Malagash, for example, in 2015. Everybody went, oh my God. Um, and I was even explaining Surabe, the Arabic script of Malagash. Well, these things are downright exotic. Fun stuff. So, and I did that very briefly. I didn't know that I had anything special and probably if it weren't for a set of circumstances, I wouldn't have been special. Um, but I ended up in a location and a situation that I could do it. When I was 19, 18, 19 years old, I managed, even though I was an average student in Greece, to get partial scholarship and an out-of-state fee waiver and study in the United States in the South. Well, I didn't have money, so I ended up staying with, babysitting with a family that spoke Hebrew. Well, I got a book. I had messed with that a little bit earlier. Seven months later, I was speaking fluent Hebrew, which I do to this day. Um, I went on to Auburn University, where I lived in a ruined house with three Indian men who spoke to each other and I wrote everything down and they all were shocked. Um, and when I finished the first doctorate in education, because suddenly, subsequently I got from University of Texas at Arlington a doctorate in psychology. Well, when I did that, I was looking for a job, you know, what women could do these days, those days was teaching. So in 1976, I got on a plane to go to Venezuela and to teach in an international biology in an international high school. Well, I was conjugating Spanish verbs in, on the airplane, converting Italian, Italian of those little Italian songs into Spanish. I go there, immediately I started looking for a university job. I, I taught for a year. Um, I went to the Universidad Católica Andrés Bello, and I said, we need a professor of experimental psychology right now. I said, pero no hablo español. He said, no se preocupe, profesor, I will figure it out. I had a textbook. Fortunately, I had the textbook in Spanish and in English. The first time I gave them a test, I said, half the class failed the test and statistics. How am I going to say the class failed? Well, I remember that I heard the word fallecer. So I told them, for those of you who know Spanish, la mitad de la clase falleció in the exam. They, they died on the test. They died laughing, obviously. By the end of the, that particular semester, that year, I was correcting their mistakes. Then I went on and did something quite interesting because you know, the World Bank was about to hire me and they wanted me to go, to, you know, to go and do a one year of field work. So I took a Fulbright Fellowship, went to Honduras. There, 
first I was teaching educational research in Spanish, no problem whatsoever, I'm a Central native level Spanish, but they were teaching Japanese. Jaika was teaching Japanese. So I said, can I please let them into the class? I'll catch up. Three or four months later, I was leaving. Uh, I had finished my assignment. They actually gave me a party because I did well. That was something like 36 years ago. I would have completely forgotten all this material, but at that time, the JICA volunteers taught Japanese songs. I kept the songs on tape. I kept the handouts. For the next 34 years or so, I have, on occasion, pulled out the songs in my from my memory, and then the vocabulary and the grammar of Japanese comes alive, which otherwise I wouldn't teach. I have tried uh, to keep up uh, the reading of katakana and hiragana, but these are the issues that give hints, which subsequently became research, of how memory works and what best we can do from memorizing sequence, sequences now that you're young and you can do it. Then I was recruited at the World Bank in 1987, from which I retired in 1980, 2013. Well, my 15 minutes of fame were actually at the Polyglot of Europe contest, where my husband insisted, saw the, the advertisement in a Greek newspaper, said, you should do that. I said, no, 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 come on, nonsense. I can't, you know, speak all of these languages at the same time. He, did, he applied for me, so suddenly I get this phone saying, we're going to speak to you in German, French, Italian, you know, Russian, and it was cursing at my husband trying to study all of this stuff together. Anyway, maybe they needed women, but I competed, and I was very mod modest, of course, with just nine languages, the bottom languages, and you see what happened. From then on, of course, the World Bank got impressed. And Michael Erard, who wrote the Babel No More uh, book that I'm sure you all know, came to interview in my office. In fact, there's a section in that book about me. But what interestingly happened is how the positions at the World Bank opened opportunities. Of course, they had something to do about me becoming a regular staff member at that time. I was a temporary. Um, South Asia department was intrigued that I could do the Hindi and then immediately, you know, Sinhalese, Bangla, Nepal, it was, it's not just fun. People, again, trusted more, understood the engagement that I brought. And there were many fun, you know, fun situations uh, involving, uh, you, know, you know, officials in various countries. Um, but what I did is I learned the main language of the countries I worked on country has 20 languages, I could only do all of them, you know, in Senegal, for example. But what I needed was not just hello and goodbye, to understand classroom instruction, to read textbooks, to talk to children and parents, and read World Bank documents with their um, uh, terminology. So I learned Arabic to work in Yemen, and I based it on Hebrew. I learned Bangla and Nepali for South Asia, relied on Hindi. Sinhalese, Portuguese, Romanian, Bahasa, all of these things I learned because of evaluation missions, because I spent 15 years in a department where I basically went at most once or twice in a country for fairly long missions. So, for example, in 2005, towards the end, I prepared Bahasa Indonesia for a month-long mission to Indonesia, which I have not repeated since then, but I have kept up the language. Same thing for Albania in Albanian, 2009, summer. Um, in 2009, again, I was transferred finally to the Global Partnership for Education, what is known today, and hosted at the World Bank. So I messed with Khmer, Lao, Wolof. As I read, you know, when I retired, I did Chicheo for literacy work, and for USAID, Malagash in 2015-16. Many, if you look up my work, you will see articles, monographs on cognitive science, a whole lot of reading fluency and reading strange scripts and math, which deal with, you know, have as a basis my personal understanding of languages and scripts that others don't know and may not want to go that way. As we said, you know, someone to be a decently performing polyglot 
you need sophisticated vocabulary. You need to deal with people you know, who speak all of this stuff. And yes, there were many fun years with many pictures, remembering children reading in Honduras, children reading in Romania, me disambiguating the Khmer uh, spelling, testing the children in Khmer. So, you know, at the age of 53, you know, here I was, you know, my husband photographed me in front of my, my language books. And this is the list that I could perform then. Um, I say that I speak a language if I have attained at least intermediate level in, uh, in it at some point in life, because I know that I can get to that automaticity uh, quickly. Otherwise, at elementary level, I did a, did a fair amount of Japanese, Khmer, Wolof, Chichewa, that I simply don't want to claim that I speak at any moment. It needs preparation. Everything needs preparation, but still. Also ancient, ancient Greek, some Latin. I studied some Sanskrit from the Delhi public school textbooks in the 90s. And there are interesting side effects because I ended up writing a number of articles, something like the Greeks and the whatever. What I have become famous for, shall I say, is the Hindi songs that were sung in Greece in the 1950s and 60s, a book with Emmanuel Casulas that we published in 1998. Um, I'm afraid this is what I will be remembered for after my death, not for cognitive psychology. Then there are historical articles about the Vlachs, the, the Albanians and the Arvanites, Northern Macedonian versus Greek Macedonian. And I'm able to make little known etymological connections between like Greek and Arabic, uh, or Greek and Swahili through Arabic. Malagash and Indonesian, which is a fascinating story that many uh, linguists have studied, and I know these languages like, of course, Hebrew and Arabic, uh, whose grammar is strikingly similar. It's, it hasn't always been pleasant, and I have to say that. So somebody says, well, you know, where are the female hyperpolyglots? There's not that many. I recall one um, Hungarian lady, not too many. But evolutionary psychology shows us a few insights about that. Today, men and women may learn languages for different reasons. Men have this cooperative competitiveness. I'm going to learn these languages better than you, but I'm going to use you and we'll all feel better. So, for example, people say study logs. How many hours today did you log? And I'm going to log more than you. And I'm going to brag about the number of hours that I log. So some hyperpolyglots become gurus, and they're greatly venerated, as you all know. Well, in regard, so women, for a lot of material, for a lot of things, end up working by themselves. No one, you people have come to me over the years and say, "How do you do this?" And I'll tell them. But I don't get the same back and forth. I certainly don't get much veneration. Uh, instead, women may become targets of jealousy. Oh, she's too weird. She's so scholarly. Instead of using makeup, you know, to get a man, you learn a language that a man speaks, that kind of stuff. She said, what? Who do you think she is? Uh, one time I was in Cambodia in 2010, I believe, where I had the temerity to propose spelling changes in this infamously complicated spelling system because I knew three other spelling and big spelling systems and one UNICEF official um, became very upset and she said that I was practicing cultural imperialism something like that and even wrote to my boss saying that I did not deserve to be there and when pressure says that she knows all of this stuff you have to see why um, and of course, credibility. Someone said, gee, you know, you're really weird. You actually are telling them how to fix this. Of course, met very urgently these days. Uh, in terms of simplification, the way, for instance, Lao has simplified. Few people know all this material together. Well, which memory functions then affect language learning and what do we know? Why all this? I will go very briefly through this because this is material for subsequent many other lectures that I have given. You may find on the internet <clears throat> in simple mem in short memory. Also. What we think about most easily is our explicit memory, that's consciously right? 
But what really matters in language learning is implicit memory, which is unconscious. We don't know how to do some stuff. And it stores these detected patterns. It's fairly stable. It gets elicited through what's called priming. They give you one stanza of a song, and then somehow, click, particularly after a little while, uh, a few moments, the rest of the song comes. That is the essential quality of language. Production, reproduction, memorization, etc. Explicit memory actually develops gradually in children and as adults become much better. It's conscious. It plays an important role in adulthood because we actually have to take a book and read the stuff. But it's subject to forgetting. Troubling is as, as children, children rely a lot on implicit memory develop all these you know, patterns. By now, we have a decent amount is understood about microRNA activation, this and that. The fact is, adults are stuck much more on explicit memory. Therefore, it's all subject to forget it. And the big test is that implicit, explicit, it needs to flow very quickly into working memory, which is very short. And you better be able, without thinking about it, to come up with the right patterns, the right words, the right stuff, while I was busy explaining World Bank policies, for example, or cognitive neuroscience of reading, or others. That is the test. And you see, we see a number of people, and frankly, sometimes I feel jealous. You see these young men, and they'll switch from language to language to language, bloop, bloop, bloop. They appear on YouTube and say, oh my God, Okay, they're automatic and fluent, at least for common words. We need to be able to retrieve those things. How do we do it? Multiple neurocognitive skills are involved. One of which, which does go down with age, is cognitive flexibility. That is the ability to switch from one language to the other. Retaining words and attaining this automaticity to where without you monitoring, the right pattern will come out. Some of us are better in some combination than others. These are the low level and obscure aspects of language and reflection. Because you have things that are hardier I don't mention. Auditory perceptual learning for audio. What did he say? And when you have slowed down audio and listened to it enough times in the beginning, we're talking about known material. Uh, is this what happens after a few times? It starts becoming clearer. You see the evolution of perceptual learning. Visual perceptual learning has to do with spelling, with new scripts. Is this a nut or a tie in Sinhala, for example, or a ka? After a while, it becomes, you become faster at it, though they're not very good. So we need, at the same time, the explicit memory for the conscious retrieval of our meanings. You need this linguistic pattern detection. And of course, at the bottom of all this, we're speaking languages in order to actually convey complex meanings and think through stuff. The very key item to do this again is this priming of memory. Priming of that memory of in advance matters very much. You try to remember it. And you do it so after hours after you need it. It's no use. It's got to come up with a few, you know, within a few seconds. It takes time. But to be able to optimize frame, priming and the priming duration, which goes away from a few hours to a few days, etc. If you expect to speak a language in a few hours and a few days, better prepare. You read that material and you have start having these linked sequences, one ready to bring to another. You read the text, you listen and sing songs that you know. The importance of, of memorized material that then you can link one item to new items, and the necessary framing period may increase with the book stage. A few years ago, here's an example. Uh, my husband and I were in the small provincial town of Greece, about an hour away from Thessaloniki, our home, and the last train had departed. And here is a bus coming, going to Albania. Now, and the bus stops in front of us and tells us that, no, we can't stop in Thessaloniki. Of course, we're going through, but we're going to well, I knew that if I opened my mouth and said, you know, please take us on in Albania and we'll, you know, come and write and pay the fare, I mean, they would have gone, oh, oh my God, of course they would have stopped. But Albanian was not in my mind. I was not primed for that at that moment. 
the five, 10 seconds of interval for which I was not primed meant that we spent the night in bed. So this is how these things happen. And we don't understand a whole lot of that because again, implicit memory is unconscious. So we forget that we forget. We have this, these illusions of continuing knowledge. Oh, you think you performed at some moment, I think I'm gonna do it again. No problem, but it's not. Explicit memory is vulnerable to forgetting. So I use them. Loose words come to mind. I says, I find my, I find loose words in my mind and either I know what they mean, but I don't know what language they're in. Is it Romanian or is it Bahas? I have no idea. By now I can look it up on Google Translate. Or they come and I know the language, but I don't know what they mean. That kind of stuff. What we want is to have some connection. Loose words don't work. So what creates a polyglot or a hyper polyglot, we need slightly longer working memory. We need a good grammatical pattern detection. Um, possibly extra gray matter in Hessel's gyrus, which is the odd, um, temporal gyrus, auditory complex, which probably is good for sound replication. Maybe implications for etymology. I'm particularly good at that, so, but I haven't had any uh, magnetic resonance imaging on that is functional and persistence, which is what I have managed to do because again, I wouldn't have, that's what stood out in my life. Now, my father was quite gifted probably. He learned Turkish, Bulgarian, German with limited content. I relatively remind, re remembers him going home and having heard during the Bulgarian occupation of drama, like 19, or something like that, instead, and asking people, what does that mean? So he had the ability, he heard something, and the ability to retain in semi long term memory. It was consolidating into long term memory long enough to go home and ask someone there, what does Svetsanamerima mean? We had him practice his Turkish at age 100, he died at 101 to keep his memory going but we understand now that we are quite vulnerable in languages to reductions at by age. As we see in this family pictures, word pairs, they optimize like by age 10, 12, letter sequences, visual reproduction. You know, by age 35, it goes, starts, you know, visual reproduction actually just gets optimized by age 20 matrix reasoning, these word lists by age 20, maybe by age you know, 25. Um, vocabulary, you can keep much longer. And of course, information, you get much better as you grow older with comprehension and stuff. But these, what language learning relies on are skills that are best performed during youth. So, the young retain phrases and compare them to new ones and then you figure out what single words mean. Adults cannot, you know, culture cannot do that very well. So it's great at pattern detection. You know, you, it's done without your awareness. So I read posts for people saying, oh, this is boring, grammar, yuck, you know, I don't want it. Instead, you get all of these very nice apps that actually optimize on the skills of the young. You can indeed memorize patterns. And it's very good and it's very important. We can use those as anchors later, but not in later age, not in the ages that I learned those, all those languages. Um, we, we use some of that, by the way, keep, I keep practicing skills that had I not done, had those kinds of jobs, I would never have because they would have gone away, including auditory perceptual learning and visual perceptual learning scripts. By the way, we become dyslexic for new scripts, past age 19, 20. That's called the new literate adult dyslexia and uh, I've written a great deal about it. So we need to learn you know, different strategies, but the songs, it's so important to memorize songs. It doesn't matter what they say in a language. Later, we will use those as anchors. And by the way, life changes, priorities change. You all don't have children if you don't already. There's other stuff to do. There's business, there's employment, there is, you know, the survival of COVID, there's all kinds of stuff. Life priorities. I mean, 
language is only a means to an end. Now that I'm retired, I teach psychology, I write textbooks, I research scripts, some of these things. Language learning is boring. Do you want to spend all your life memorizing more pure permutations of the same concept? It's hard to be a professional language learner. But you've got to do it because maybe my ability to memorize at this moment is 15% of what I could do, but I got to give up the reputation. This ability is intrinsic to my identity. So I curate the languages I learned and that creates more exercise. My goal is really to be three or four days away from fluency. So if organization, for example, asks me tomorrow to go on mission to Tanzania, I need to be able to prepare and perform again. And I can. And what to do, you've got to actually keep reviewing, relearning, reconsolidating. And every time you reconsolidate, um, the form, the subsequent reconsolidates improves. And we have a number of you have read about spaced learning. What happens with the years is on one hand, I'm not as good at memorizing because we see how that skill, those skills get optimized in the lower grade levels, uh, ages. But I know more than ever what to do in order to learn a language and to read one. So I, in some respects, I'm more efficient than ever. So I use the following, particularly the rarely used languages, need maintenance, reviews of old materials, retrieval, relearning, audio. I must then slow down audio, that then you will have very few items to think about in working memory. First, I need to study the books. There's too many tasks in real life, too many tasks in for me. But this is about 1997. I, I ride every Saturday and every Sunday for 20 miles. So for years, I would study while I was still at work. I would study on the bus, of course. So I would study. And then the studied material I took with me initially on tape recorders that were slowed down. There's a Sony tape recorder. Then there were language repeaters that were tape based and that would repeat um, the last 30, uh, 60 seconds, for example. And now it's all audio and they're excellent apps, uh, which I can recommend if someone wants to know, um, that do this. But this is what I do every weekend. It needs, for the, at least the past 15 months, I have gone through all my retrieves, all the lesser known or lesser used languages. I try to prepare before I go and uh, then I listen to them. You need, of course, this is excellent time use. You need low cognitive load. And this is what today, for instance, I'm going to study in my bicycle. I want to listen to well-known content. But then um, I need to be able to take, you know, the consolidation path, the retrieval path, the way items are linked in your memory, the way you learned it, or they're most easily retrieved. If you create a different permutation of words, you'll have to relearn all the linkages. So before you do learn, you know, mess with a different thing, oh, I used to know French 20 years ago. See if you can find your old textbooks. So what I do, I take all the known material first. I write in quiet residential streets. I study ahead of time. If the listening part is too demanding, I find that I slow down. So I need to have you know, rather low cognitive load. For example, last April with COVID here, we couldn't go to Greece. I spent like two months on the Swahili Foreign Service Institute course, which is quote unquote, very boring and perfect for this kind of thing. Repeating patterns of all those noun classes, for any one of you know, who knows Bantu languages, you know what I'm talking about. And yes, today I'm not sure, but I know that if I can retrieve one thing, it will prime the next. And I will say, uh oh, this particular um, item has a mistake. Well, how have the language learning aids changed over the years? I mean, all this stuff is pension, sure. But the material is the same. In the 1990s, I used to load my backpack with tapes, dictionaries for memory for missions to Nepal and Bangladesh, where a backpack was all. 
the sites were filled with tapes. Now, of course, we have Google Translate, Bing, even Yandex um, for pictures, for fast decide, text deciphering and for typing. And yes, it makes a lot of difference. At the same time, I mean, unfortunately, dictionaries have become obsolete. But that is also unfortunate because what you get in Google Translate is really one subset of material. But by the time you reach out for paper, you actually see the alphabetic sequence of stuff. Um, it's a problem. And I have this big, the other day I brought down big dictionaries of Sinhalese. Uh, you know, Google Translate doesn't even have 10% of that. But it's a hassle. So yeah, one settled for the least, you know, the most easy. One interesting thing about Google Translate is you can ask it to write stuff. And of course, it'll write with mistakes. When you know the language, you can correct those mistakes. So I'll produce, you know, Bahasa, Albanian, but what other ways have to scrounge my brain. It becomes much more efficient. Um, but the language apps, I'm not at all enthused about. I know many of you rely on them and they're great and I've tried. They don't teach enough content, not for the uses that I have. Yeah, it's very good to set goals. You can pick up badges and feel uh, reinforced. A few times I signed up for these things, they kept pestering me, you know, do your Dutch today. I didn't need Dutch. The content is too little tiny, and that is the problem. So the lessons for your own self, your older self, well, if you decide to learn a language and claim that you speak it, just actually, you know, reach at least, at least an intermediate level. And those who know more, remember more. The apps are great, but they can't carry you too far. And you need to review over the years. You need to keep your old books and materials. Explore that retrieval path to relearning ability. Memorize stuff, songs, chants, curses, whatever the hell. And you use the slow down audio, that channel stays with us. That ability to actually learn when we are supported by uh, content, you know, by written content, while walking, driving, jogging. Um, and yes, there's equipment to, and, you know, apps and buttons to slow things down. If you have old tapes, digitize them. Learn and repeat the songs by heart. Aim to have good chains of priming from one linguistic text to the next, so that you must know the grammar, conjugate verbs and nouns in some reasonable order. Now, your age may, old age may be different. You know, baby, by your, the time you're 60, you know, direct transmission to the brain may be practical, whether that's ethical or not, a question that's being considered. Maybe the language of your choice will be reviewed in other ways. But conscious and systematic review is all we have at this time. I wish you very well. I am very available to um, answer questions and to communicate. And I thank you for listening.